the Middle East is perilously close to all-out war. Millions have been displaced from their homes in Gaza, Israel, the West Bank and now Lebanon, and thousands killed. After a year in which Israel and the Iranian-backed militant group Hezbollah exchanged rocket and artillery fire across the Lebanese border, Israel has escalated the conflict in recent weeks. It killed the Hezbollah leader Hasran Nasrallah in Beirut, targeted the organization's leadership in radio and pager attacks and continues to bomb the Lebanese capital. In response, Hezbollah has now begun launching rockets deeper into Israel at Haifa and Tel Aviv. Iran's response was to launch a barrage of missiles at Israel, the majority of which were intercepted by Israel's Iron Dome air defense system. Now the world is waiting to see how Israel decides to retaliate. Meanwhile, in Gaza, the humanitarian crisis deepens as the death toll continues to rise. At least 42,965 people have been killed in Gaza by Israel in its response to the Hamas-led attacks on October the 7th, which killed more than 1,100 people in southern Israel. More than 200 people were also taken hostage, 97 of whom are still unaccounted for a year later. We've decided to cover this moment of escalation by speaking to two experts from the Middle East, Mirai Rebez and Amnon Aaron, to get a sense of the strategic calculations being made by both Israel and its neighbours at this frightening moment for the region. I'm Gemma Ware, and this is The Conversation Weekly, The World Explained by Experts. First, I'm joined by Mirai Rebez, Chair of Middle East Studies at Dickinson College in Pennsylvania in the US. Mirai, who's originally from Lebanon, is also Associate Professor of Francophone and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at the college. She's finalizing a book looking at Hezbollah's unlawful activities in Lebanon since 1982 and is also researching the Beirut barrack bombings of 1983 that killed 241 American service members and 58 French parachutists. Welcome, Mirai. Thank you for having me. So, Mirai, let's jump straight in if we can. What strategic and political calculations are being made by the local leaders in Lebanon in response to the recent escalation between the Israeli Defence Forces and Hezbollah, and particularly in the bombing of Beirut in recent days? You know, when I saw the question, I immediately thought, are we talking about the state of Lebanon or are we talking about the leaders of Hezbollah? Because they're two separate entities from um legal position, the state of Lebanon, which is a failed state at this point, um, nevertheless, the state of Lebanon has, from a military position, has reaffirmed its commitment to the United Nations Resolution 1701, which is its commitment to peace in a sense that there's no Hezbollah fighters within the blue line under the Litani River and among other things. And more so when Israel declared its intention to have limited ground operation in Lebanon and, and as well as uh, larger strikes, the state of Lebanon withdrew its uh, formal Lebanese armed forces. And this is significant because from an international law point of view, this means that uh, there is a separation between the state of Lebanon or its leaders and the Iranian proxy militia of Hezbollah. And also the qualification of the conflict would remain a state on non-state actor rather than having a full armed conflict or international armed conflict between the state of Israel and the state of Lebanon. Now, of course, Hezbollah's leader is a whole different story. Officially, it was created in 1985 by its manifesto, but before that, it actually was created as a response to the Israeli invasion of Beirut, the two-month siege that was imposed on Beirut. And that's even by the admission of the own Israeli leadership, like Ehud Barak in a 2006 interview admitted that Hezbollah was created as a response to the Israeli invasion. And if Israel had not invaded, it would not have existed. Now, of course, it would not have existed without the mobilization of the Shiite community, which was a marginalized community back in the 1980s in South Lebanon, and it was fully supported by the state of Iran. So in terms of military goals, in 1985, based on its official manifesto, Hezbollah always positioned itself as an opposition to the existence of the state of Israel, particularly the Zionist expansion agenda in the region. Furthermore, it affirmed the dedication to the Palestinian cause. It affirmed its commitment to the Iranian uh, revolution and the Shiite ideology. Fast forward, we're still into that mentality of 
in terms of military goals. And in terms of on the ground, how did this appear? It appeared immediately as of October 8th with the imminent attack that happened between Hezbollah and Israel. And of course, the response increased in violence throughout time. So at the first, it was tit for tat. It was a military borders response. And so, for instance, initially the response of Hezbollah in terms of military, it was uh, targeting up to three kilometers into inside Israel. Now we're talking about targeting Tel Aviv. There were attempts to attack the Mossad headquarters. Just this morning, there was an attack on Haifa, rockets being launched by Hezbollah. So the military goals are definitely shifting in terms of intensity, in terms of how far they are reaching within Israel. But the nutshell of it remains the same. As opposed to Iran, now it's important to recognize that Hezbollah is Iranian-backed militia operating from Lebanon. Iran's military goals are completely aligned with Hezbollah, so there is still that desire of expansion in the region. Now, the Iranian goal wouldn't have been happening if the United States had not destabilized Iraq. We're talking about 20 years plus going back in time, the destabilization of Iraq and when Iraq fell into a full chaos and war allowed for Iran to meddle into Iraq and gave a big voice to the Shiite conservative voices. 2011, the Syrian civil war, Syria descended into chaos. The Shiite or the Alawites, uh, more precisely, are in power. Hezbollah stepped in into Syria to defend the regime. So the point that I'm showing here is like it's a domino effect, like it's expansion from Iran to Iraq to Syria to Lebanon. And this is clearly visible in um, Iran's military goals, which is ultimately it's the expansion of the Iranian ideology in the region. Honestly, at this point, I would say there is an attempt to hide behind the Palestinian cause to achieve that goal. Looking at Iran more specifically, because it's obviously a significant player in this war with, as you say, its alliances with Hezbollah and with groups such as the Houthis in, in Yemen, and also through its direct retaliation on Israeli territory, first in April and now most recently in, in early October. How might the kind of weighing up of what happens next be happening in Iran and particularly in the last few weeks? And how might this influence the, the broader regional conflict? I wish I could predict what the future holds, but there is a lot that is happening and a lot of moving pieces. So, for instance, we are seeing more and more attacks from the Houthis in the Red Sea, the Kata'ib of Hezbollah in Iraq. You know, they're vowing retaliation. As you said, you mentioned the October 1st Iranian attacks, which for me, it's all a play, right? Like they led nothing to nowhere. Just like the April's attack, they led to nothing. I would say Iran's response right now is really contingent on one important issue, which is the nuclear deal. The amount of death we're seeing in the Middle East at this point, I would say many civilians are paying the price just because Iran has an agenda and ultimately is how it's going to negotiate its nuclear deal with the United States. And, you know, whether it's going to expand on the region or not, I would say that ultimately this is the goal for Iran. What do we know then of, of the reaction of the Iranian people mm -hmm. to this moment, to this escalation? Well, it's a very interesting question because we cannot look at the Iranian people's reaction without looking back about two years ago what happened with the killing of Mahsa Amini and the uprising that happened against the Iranian regime. The uprising was led by women and men, you know, like we tend to think that women in Iran are oppressed and that men are happy about it, which is not true. So the killing of Mahsa Amini and the uprising against the Iranian regime is extremely important to look at because it showed that a lot of people from different sects, different ethnicity, different class are actually dissatisfied with the Iranian regime. The economy on Iran is not thriving. There is a serious inflation. There is a serious unemployment among youth. And the Iranian regime is making it sound that they're united and then everything is fine. But reality is we saw the brutal crushing of the Iranian people when the Mahsa Amini happened. As a matter of fact, this is the hypocrisy of the global north. When Mahsa Amini's uprising happened, the global north, like we saw women cut their hair in parliaments and Time magazine post Iranian women 
women and their bravery with their hair and so on. But reality is, as this was happening, the export of Iranian oil had increased and it was being bought by European countries such as Bulgaria because, you know, of the Ukrainian crisis. And so we see this fake discourse of, yay, let's support human rights in Iran and the Iranian uprising. But reality on the ground, within a year, it was dead. So all of this to say that on the ground, we don't know what the Iranian people are saying because they were brutally crushed two years ago. And as a matter of fact, on the year anniversary of Mahsa Amini's killing, we saw the arrest of her uncle and some members of her family just because they were trying to create a commemorative service for her. I would hazard to guess that the Iranian people are extremely dissatisfied with what's happening, despite what the media is showing that Many Iranian people want the retaliation for the killing of Hassan Nasrallah, for instance. But I would hazard to guess that there is serious displeasure inside Iran. I want to turn now to the role of of other Arab states, because in in 2020, several Arab states, including the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco and Sudan, signed a series of agreements with Israel known as the Abraham Accords. Since the Hamas-led October 7th attacks, these accords have stalled. Saudi Arabia, which was also on its path to normalisation, said it won't proceed until an independent Palestinian state is established. And yet in spite of this, Arab states have been accused of remaining relatively silent on the Palestinian cause, with some maintaining economic ties with Israel. What do you think is driving this relative silence from the Arab world? And what does it say really about the broader regional dynamics that we're seeing? So uh, multiple things. If I look historically at the Palestinian cause, the Arab voice has never really been unified or fully there. And people who were in the front line were people in the Fertile Crescent or the Levant area. Like I wouldn't say there were strong, strong voices coming from other places. But there is this fallacy in thinking that all the Arabs are united or even all the Jews are united. It's, it's not true. Within the Jewish voice, there is a diversity of voices and opinions. And even in the Arab voice, that is the case. You have from the all conservative to the all progressive and everything in between. Now, in terms of the Abraham Accord, it's important to recognize that it's not just about normalizing relations. It's also recognition of statehood. So, for instance, the uh, Emirates and uh, Sudan recognize the state of Israel. You know, it's a different level of just normalizing economical relations. In terms of specific silence, I would say that some of the countries, they kept silent, but on the other hand, they send humanitarian aid or every now and then they put out a political statement condemning the rise of violence. I'm particularly thinking of the Emirates, for instance, because it's a powerful player in the region. There are multiple ways of interpreting this. The Emirates and Bahrain, they have a real fear of the Iranian expansion and the Shiite ideology in the region. We saw this in the Bahrain, for instance, in the execution of a Shiite sheikh who is considered a leader. So uh, the Emirates' response and the Bahrain's response is purely a response against the expansion of the Shiite ideology. In other words, it's in its interest to create that buffer zone through partnering with Israel. And so that's one. Also, let's talk about economics opportunities or tourism. It's a market, right? Saudi Arabia is allowing, for instance, for aviation, Israeli aviation to fly above its land, which was not the case previously, right? So we're really talking about statehood recognition, economic expansion, Uh, not just normalization. We're talking about opportunity, but more importantly, about a buffer zone against Iran. And of course, ultimately, this would have led to the normalization of relationship with Saudi Arabia, which, you know, October 7 happened. Saudi Arabia put this on hold. And now Saudi Arabia is, you know, like, no, we're not going to do it unless there's a recognition of Palestinian statehood. On the other hand, very recently, the Jordanian foreign minister Ayman Safadi, despite the silence, asserted that 57 Arab and Muslim countries are willing to provide security for Israel in return of Palestinian statehood. So, yes, there is silence, but that's a very powerful statement, too, that was heavily ignored. And of course, the deal was shut down and Prime Minister Netanyahu was like, no, we're not interested. So... Silence versus a really heavy promise, and it led to nowhere. What do you think the escalation could mean for the future of resistance movements, so militant groups or otherwise, within Lebanon and the Palestinian territories? How does that shape the longer-term prospects for peace? 
in my mind, one can kill a leader, but one cannot kill an idea, right? And this is not me endorsing terrorism or supporting anything. This is me factually reading what's on the ground. We saw the Dahi doctrine, so bombing Beirut, its infrastructure with the idea of suffocating Hezbollah. It didn't work, right? We saw 82 to 2000, the occupation of south of Lebanon with the idea of creating a buffer zone to secure the safety of northern Israel. It didn't work. So my concern is that fire cannot extinguish fire. In, in other words, that the idea of the axis of resistance, which is what Iran and its allies in the region call the itself, United States calls it the axis of evil, it's not going to be easy to combat just by bombing it, right? We saw the failure of that in Iraq, for instance, right? Like we're going to bomb Iraq to establish a democracy. It didn't work. So what I'm trying to say here is that I have a serious concern that the more we go on in this war, the more blood is shed, the more we move away from a ceasefire and a sustainable resolution to the Israel-Palestine conflict, the more likely we're going to see a strong resolve of these groups to continue fighting. And I want to uh, make it clear here, the fighting that is happening on the ground, there is no doubt that there's terrorism involved and that terrorism has appropriated the Palestinian cause. What I'm trying to say here that there is legitimacy in Palestinian right for self-determination that has been hijacked by the Iranian and their proxies to expand their ideology in the region. I have legitimate concerns that we will not see a stop in the fight, because at this point, a stop in the fight would be from Hezbollah's point of view or the Houthis or the Kataib of Hezbollah in Iraq. It's really a question for all of these players in the region, including Israel, of survival. It's no longer about respecting international law. That ship has sailed. Nobody is respecting international law anymore. It's really a question of survival. It's really a question of resolve. It's really a question of uh, saving face, of fear of embarrassment. Hezbollah right now cannot stop, period. It's either it will continue till the end, because let's imagine Hezbollah signs a ceasefire. Like, what will be its image in the region? So I would say the future is terrifying because we're talking about a reaffirming of this resolve, of this dedication to what they believe to be their cause. It all depends also on what will happen within coming next days. Are we talking about full-blown ground invasion? Are we talking about continuity of airstrikes? Are we talking about annexation of West Bank and Gaza? Are we talking about occupation of South Lebanon? Like there's so many variables, but for me, the future looks bleak and I'm terrified of the bloodshed that is gonna come. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. My second guest today is Amnon Aran. Amnon is Professor of International Relations at City St. George's University of London. His research focuses on the Arab-Israeli conflict and the foreign policy of Middle Eastern states. And he's recently written a book on Israeli foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. You may also remember him from a series we did on The Conversation Weekly back in September 2023, marking 30 years since the Oslo Peace Accords. Welcome back to the show, Amnon. Thank you for having me. When Israel began its attacks on southern Lebanon, it said it wanted to secure the return of 60,000 people displaced from their homes in northern Israel by rockets fired by Hezbollah from Lebanon. What now are the wider political and strategic calculations being made within the Israeli government about this escalation and where it goes from here? What essentially does Israel want from this moment? So I think when we look at Lebanon, really, I think around June, we saw the shift Beginning, the Israelis seem to conclude that they've completed, if you like, the major military offensive in the Gaza Strip. And that's when they began to shift their forces to the northern border. I think in the last three weeks or so, even the Israelis, it seems to me, have been surprised by what they conceive or what they define as being successes. It began with the walkie-talkie and beeper explosions, which Israel didn't take responsibility on, but is widely thought that Israel has been behind. But I think more significantly, the Israeli ability to effectively assassinate almost the whole of the Hezbollah political leadership, the vast majority of the military leadership as well, uh, gave the feeling to the Israelis that they are now on the front foot. 
I think in terms of what they're trying to achieve, they've been accused of not doing anything, not being active enough, only being defensive. And the combination of these heavy bombardments that we're seeing now in the Dahil and Beirut, in addition to the ground force entry into the southern part of Lebanon, I think signified that the Israelis at least want to secure the territory adjacent on the other side of the border. And that's why the invasion has actually moved from east to west, rather than like we saw in previous invasions, where there was a big sort of entry, a very fast entry from south to north. What we've seen here is an east-west deployment of forces. At this point, I don't think the Israelis are trying or are seeking to establish a long-term, what they called security zone, as we saw, for example, after the 1982 Israeli-Lebanon war. But I wouldn't rule out at least temporary control of that area to effectively remove and destroy the fortifications that Hezbollah built there and the weapons depots that the IDF seems to be finding. However, uh, what the Israelis are also dealing with is a growing number, more frequent and also deeper rocket attacks coming from Lebanon into Israel. They've got a deeper Haifa, Tel Aviv. And I think although because of the Israeli defense missiles, they have not resulted in significant losses in terms of human life, they are causing significant disruption to everyday life. And on the back of already one year of war, I think one of the biggest challenges the Israelis face is actually how long they can actually sustain this kind of reality where large parts of the country have this interruption. So with that in mind, as you say, it's been a year of war and this week Israel is marking a year since the October 7th attacks. What then is the mood really within the Israeli population to this escalation that we've seen over the last few weeks? In Israel, the past 12 months have really been described as an existential moment. And the narrative has been very much of an existential moment in Holocaustian terms. And I think this is one of the reasons why we have seen the type of response that we've seen in the Gaza Strip and in Lebanon. And I think the other thing is, is that this existential feeling also coincided with the institutionalization of a very extreme government in power. And therefore, when the question came about how to respond to this existential threat, it was very much from the prism of what I call elsewhere a form of entrenchment, which really means that Israel only makes peace uh, in exchange for peace. Any diplomatic arrangement has to be dependent upon and subordinate to military advantageous balance of power towards Israel, and that the Palestinians in the West Bank and now in the Gaza Strip would remain under Israeli occupation for the foreseeable future. This is why we saw the kind of warfare that we saw in the Gaza Strip. And it seems to me that this existential feeling coinciding with a very, if you like, hawkish outlook also explains what we're seeing now in Lebanon. After Iran's recent launch of ballistic missiles against Israel on the 1st of October, the former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett wrote on X, formerly known as Twitter, that Israel now has its greatest opportunity in 50 years to change the face of the Middle East. Also, some Israeli politicians, including Benjamin Netanyahu, have voiced or implied perhaps ambitions for territorial expansion in recent months, including into occupied Palestinian land and Lebanon. Some commentators have compared this moment to 1967, when Israel gained control over the Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem. Do you see parallels between the current escalation and the 1967 war? And how prevalent do you think this sentiment is within Israeli politics about the territorial ambitions? I don't think there are that many parallels with 1967, not least uh, in terms of the duration. Uh, 1967 war was a war of six days. It started and ended. Here we're actually in a war where we're not really even close possibly to seeing the end of it. And this goes back to the other part of your question about Naftali Bennett's comments. So I, I think actually in Israel, there's been a very fierce debate about what to do now. And Naftali Bennett represents one side of that debate, saying that this is an unprecedented opportunity for Israel to attack Iran's nuclear facilities, an opportunity that will not return because Hezbollah has been weakened to the extent that it has and that Hamas effectively is no longer an operational force in terms of threatening Israel. You know, Hamas might and still is work as a guerrilla a force, but as a force that can actually threaten Israel and participate in what Iran calls the axis of resistance, Hamas is no longer there and Hezbollah is significantly weakened. So from that point of view, this is the rationale of Naftali Bennett. This is an opportune moment for Israel to attack Iran's 
nuclear facilities. But there is another side, which is also quite voiceful, also within the military establishment, that says, if you do attack Iran's nuclear facilities, and even if that is successful, that is a reason for war, for a full-blown war. And then the question that comes up is, how do you end this war? And after a year of being in a prolonged and very difficult conflict, the next question is how you are actually starting a war, presumably on five or six fronts, including a very vast country, 90 million people, Iran with very rich history, and you are actually entering into a very new phase, which could become very prolonged. And therefore, perhaps the emphasis should be on weakening Hezbollah as much as possible, and then moving really to the framework that the United States Biden administration have suggested for a long time to find some kind of deal, return to the normalization tool through the Saudis, and then on the basis of that, create a regional coalition together with the United States that would be much more effective in containing Iran at a lower price. And this is really the lines of the debate in Israel. Which one is winning at the moment on those sides? I think it's very difficult to say. And I think there are very few people in Israel right now that really know. I think we will obviously get a very strong indication by what targets the Israelis decide to attack when they launch their retaliatory attack, which I suspect they will. And they've basically got five categories. They can attack nuclear sites, they can go for military facilities, they can go for energy facilities, oil, they could go for state symbols and for assets owned by the Revolutionary Guards. If they went for two of these groups, military sites, especially those used to launch the missiles or Revolutionary Guards, that would still remain within the equations, if you like, that we've been talking about so much in the war. However, if the Israelis go for a nuclear sites or even for Iran's energy depositories, then we are entering into a very new and I think uncharted waters. So it's very difficult to say where we are. In relation to your question about territorial ambitions, I think at the moment, the only political factions in Israel that are officially talking about territorial expansion are people like Itamar ben Gvir and Bitsalil Smotrich. They have stated explicitly that they would want to resettle the Gaza Strip. Netanyahu has denied that on several occasions. Uh, he said that Israel has no intention to do that. But having said that, life has an interesting dynamic that things sometimes happen. The Gaza Strip at the moment is in a very dire humanitarian situation. The Israelis have rejected any kind of external intervention in the Gaza Strip. At the moment, there's no deal on the hostages. And therefore, there is a big question about who can actually deliver the humanitarian aid in the Gaza Strip. Hamas has not done that in good faith. The Israelis have also imposed their difficulties in terms of transferring humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip. So there will come a time, and the winter is coming very close, and the question will become more acute, I suspect, on what do you do with the over 2 million people in the Gaza Strip? How do you prevent famine? How do you prevent the widespread of disease? And we now hear that Netanyahu has asked the IDF to explore the idea that the IDF would now become responsible for distributing the humanitarian aid. If that will happen, that will be one step forward towards Israel, if you like, asserting more control over the Gaza Strip than it has had before. At the moment, the aid is split between a web of international humanitarian organizations and UN agencies and the role that Hamas plays in that as well. So to sum up, I think we don't have an official ambition for territorial expansion, not to push the Israeli-Lebanese border uh, northwards for, um, for, for a permanent position, and also not to resettle the Gaza Strip. Historically, Israel has received more US foreign aid than any other country. I think it's over $300 billion since Israel's creation in 1948. And since the escalation on October the 7th, the US has provided Israel with additional military aid, as have countries in the EU, most notably Germany and Italy. Israel clearly has military superiority and air defense superiority of, of its own territory compared to its neighbors, including Iran. What does that mean for Israeli foreign policy and what it decides to do next, that military power imbalance? I think it, it means that in any type of decision the Israelis made, the American factor will be present, but it will not be the only factor that determines the final decision. We've seen this when the Americans all but demanded the Israelis not to go into Rafah, then the Israelis did. The Biden administration repeatedly asked the Israelis to be more careful with civilian casualties. According to the president, um, he firmly still thinks that there have been too many civilian casualties. And I think we also know that the Israelis 
informed, but perhaps not asked for permission before they assassinated very high-level figures such as Hassan Nasrallah. I think probably the area that the American factor matters most does concern Iran. If, for example, the Biden administration uh, would say to the Israelis, look, we agree with the analysis of Naftali Bennett that you mentioned earlier, that this is the time to strike the Iranian nuclear facilities, I think that would significantly, dramatically increase the chances that the Israelis would go ahead with this kind of assault. But of course, very shortly now, we're in the final stretch of the presidential election. It would seem that the Biden administration is not keen for that to happen, and therefore that could have a qualifying effect. So I think the Israelis have had and actually have expanded what I would call uh, their autonomy in their foreign policy decision making, although that is not tantamount to having full independence in foreign policy decision. And this is, I think, where sort of the US factor comes in. What do you see perhaps as the only long term solution to ending the conflict and, and how can it be implemented? So I think here we're now actually talking already about multiple conflicts. So if we looked at 7 October 2023, we were looking almost primarily on Israel and the Palestinians with the focus of, of the war that was taking place in Gaza. The shift of the military confrontation now to Lebanon has now opened up, if you like, two other conflicts. One is between Israel and Hezbollah, which has been longstanding. And we have seen the most intense period in terms of the conflict between Israel and Iran, that has also been going on in the shadows for several years, but we have not seen these direct attacks like the ones that were launched by Iran in April and October. So I think there's really a question here about the two conflicts. I think in relation to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I'm increasingly of the view that the idea of resolving this conflict through a two-state solution within the, if you like, confines of what was once mandated Palestine I think it has been tried so many times. I think we might conclude that is not possible. I equally think that uh, what some people talk, especially in the West, about a one-state solution is equally impossible. And therefore, I think we really should begin to think a bit much more creatively about something that actually Hanan Ashrawi told me in the previous podcast that I did here. She said, it doesn't matter that much if we have a one-state or two-state. We need a solution that does secure liberty, freedom, and dignity for the Palestinian people. And I think a Palestinian state should come about, but what should be the borders in that state, how much, for example, territory it could have through agreements of leasing, let's say with Egypt, through massive economic aid from the Gulf, through perhaps political arrangements that go elsewhere and also can involve the diaspora. These are very intricate issues, but I think the idea that we can somehow carve two states out of this very narrow territory between the river and the sea, to me, is becoming extremely difficult. I think in relation to Hezbollah and Iran, what is very worrying is that from 7th of October 2023, the only thing that we have seen is really a trajectory that was one of escalation. Apart from a very short period of this temporary ceasefire we saw in November, all we have seen is escalation. And what we know about very big wars is that actually they don't start in one moment. You know, World War II, we had the kind of prelude in the Spanish Civil War. So my worry is now is that if, if we don't have some sort of framework that can, a political framework that can bring the fighting to an end, what we are seeing certainly in the short term is a much more significant escalation. What could that framework be? Some sort of political framework that really lays down a fortified framework of Resolution 1701, which effectively Hezbollah goes north of the Litani River. But also, I do not see uh, something that goes further than that, for example, along the lines of Resolution 1559, which called for the disarmament of Hezbollah. And that could be in parallel with some sort of diplomatic reprieve to Iran. I still think that Iran is really the main engine behind the so-called axis of resistance or axis of terrorism. Especially in Hezbollah's weakened position at the moment, I, I suspect they would find it very difficult to continue fighting if Iran would take a strategic decision that this is not in its favor. But at the moment, one has to ask, what does Iran get from it? Is the regime sufficiently under threat? Possibly not. Do they have enough incentives to do that? Probably not. Can we have actually a decision that anybody can respect at the twilight of the Biden administration? Joe Biden can promise anything he wants at the moment, but what happens after the 1st of November? Who knows? And that, of course, unfortunately coincides with a very critical month 
in this conflict in which actually we could escalate quite significantly. So I think it, it would be very difficult now to orchestrate some sort of diplomatic solution unless there is a very sudden change in the military balance of power in either side's favor to the point that one of the sides feels that they're really at a point where some sort of offered diplomatic solution is the best exit ramp they have. But failing that, I suspect that the trajectory that we've seen over the last year, that of escalation, is unfortunately what, at least in the short term, we're likely to see. For the safety and security and livelihoods of many people in the Middle East, I, I do hope that that trajectory and that off front happens. But thank you very much, Amnon, for coming on and sharing your thoughts with us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. That's it for this week's show. Thanks to our colleagues Matt Williams in the US and Jonathan Est in the UK, who are among those leading the conversation's coverage of the escalation in the Middle East. This episode was produced by Mend Marawani. Sound design was by Michelle Macklem, and our theme music is by Nita Saal. Stephen Khan is our global executive editor, and I'm Gemma Ware, the executive producer. You can connect with us on Instagram at theconversation.com or email us directly at podcast at theconversation.com. You can also sign up for The Conversation's free daily newsletter by clicking on the link in our show notes. The Conversation is a non-profit news outlet dedicated to sharing the work of academic experts with a wider audience. If you like what we do, please support us at donate.theconversation.com and please do also rate and review the podcast. Thanks for listening.